think you are caught in a prisoner's dilemma type situation because the other country has exactly the same type of motive to implement a protectionist policy. And then if the two of them do, them, do, do the same, each one imposes the optimal tariff, then think about the two-stage game. In the first stage, each government chooses the optimal policy, and then the second stage, firms uh, choose their output, and they sell it, and so on. Then, if the countries are not too different from each other, then ex post, they both will be worse off than under free trade. So for a, a single country, this might be a good policy, but for the two of them in this example jointly, this can turn out to be a very bad policy. And so they may want to reach some agreement and tie their hands, and this is one justification for the multilateral tariff negotiations that typically took place under the GATT at the time and the World Trade Organization more, more recently. And then there was a huge literature which tried to bring up uh, other motives for trade policy, such as arguments about the second best. So you think about a situation in which you have some distortion in the economy, and you cannot remove this distortion. Then the general theory of the second best says, well, if you cannot remove this distortion, you might benefit from introducing some other distortion that will offset it, at least partially. And there are examples in which trade policy will offset partially an existing distortion, in particular distortions in labor markets, uh, which were of concern to people. And therefore, this will provide some justification to trade policy. But there's very little evidence that this is a, a, a major motive uh, for trade. So the third motive, the self ex explanation, which is what I will discuss today, is the political econ economy of protection. A sort of fundamental uh, paper uh, in this regard is an early piece by Anne Kruger in 1974, which is a paper about uh, rent-seeking, essentially. Uh, and she sort of explains uh, in great detail in a particular theoretical framework how rent seeking will lead to the formulation of protection. And then there is a literature which uh, took off from there, which is a literature on rent seeking, and it uh, sort of is related to a much larger literature on rent seeking, uh, in particular which came out of the then uh, Virginia School of uh, Political Economy, which was led by Buchanan and Tallock and uh, other people. In the 1980s, there were a number of attempts to introduce political economy elements into trade policy formation, which go beyond M. Kruger's original insight. Uh, so let me briefly mention uh, some approaches and uh, see some of their limitations and then move on to uh, this sort of pro uh, protection for sale approach that Jim Grossman and I developed. And after I describe it, I'll, di I'll discuss the empirical work that was done uh, using this particular framework. Okay, so instead of dealing with the different approaches in alternative analytical frameworks, I, I, I'm going to use one particular framework all along the way. This will make life easier for all of us. Uh, so think about the following. Think about an economy. To begin with, it's a small economy, so it cannot affect its terms of trade. So the Harry Johnson argument for protection is out. We don't have to worry about it. Okay? Then think about the situation in which there are N plus 1 goods produced by N plus 1 industries. And unlike the complicated production structures that we discussed yesterday and the day before yesterday, here we'll assume something very simple. So every industry manufactures a homogeneous product. One industry, say industry zero, produces it only with labor, with a fixed input of labor per unit output, 
So this basically this allows us to fix the wage in terms of this numerical product. It's a very convenient analytical device. All the other sectors use both labor and the sector-specific input. And the role of the sector-specific inputs will be very simple. These are the inputs that will be owned by interest groups. And they will try to maximize the return to this ownership of these inputs. Now, the general approach that I will discuss can be applied to many other analytical frameworks as well. But in this setup, it works very, in a very clean way. And also, I can basically discuss all our approaches, other approaches, in, in, in exactly the same framework. So, so I think it's easier to understand, essentially, what happens. OK, so the way we are going to think about it now is the following. There are domestic prices, PI of product I. And good zero is our numerator, so we don't worry about it. And pi, lowercase pi i is the international price of the good. So this is a small country. It takes the inter prices of every good on the international market as given. And so what the government can do, it can raise the domestic price, say, above the international price by imposing a tariff. But if it wants to reduce the domestic price, Below the international price, it can also do it. Now here, you can sort of think about different trade policies depending on whether the good is imported, whether it's exported, and whether you want to raise the domestic price or to reduce the domestic price. The key is the following, that whenever there are interest groups of people who own these sector-specific inputs, they gain from high domestic prices. So they typically we want the price to go up. But if they are consumers of goods, then they want the price to come down. So there are sort of conflicts depending on whether you allow consumption considerations to be represented in the political process or not. For the most part, I assume that you can. But uh, I'll tell you what happens if, if not, if only production considerations are represented in the political process. So in particular, what it means is the following. If the good is imported and I want a high domestic price, then I can do it via a tariff. If the good is exported and I want to raise the domestic price, then I have to provide an export subsidy. And if I want to reduce the price, then it's just the reverse. For imports, it's an, instead of a tariff, it's an, a subsidy to imports. And for, a ter for an exports, it's a tax on exports if I want to reduce the domestic price. So these are essentially the instruments uh, with which the government uh, is endowed in this economy. So now assume that preferences are quasi-linear and separate. So what does it mean? It means that there's a constant marginal utility of consuming the good zero, our numerical good. And then there is some concave preference for each other good, and they are additive. This is the simplest structure of preferences, going back to a famous paper by Hautakel from 1965. Now, what's the advantage of this structure? It has one very simple advantage, and this is you can use consumer surplus analysis. You, have, you are justified to use consumer surplus analysis under this structure. So then, the demand for any particular product, except for the numeraire, depends only on the price of the product. If that, there are no income effects in these consumption levels. So this is why you can use consumer surplus, because there are no income effects. So the demand function for every such product is downward sloping. It depends only on its own price. Then you can calculate the demand. You can calculate the consumer surplus. And you can then calculate the indirect utility function, which takes this form. So this is the aggregate indirect utility function, which aggregates the preferences of everybody. You sort of add up the utilities of everybody in the economy. In a moment, we'll want to disaggregate and look at preferences of particular individuals. But it's sort of easy to understand what this represents. So 
L is the labor supply. So given that the wage rate is 1, this is in uh, labor income, aggregate labor income. Then capital pi i, which is a function of pi, is the reward to the sector-specific input in industry i. Is the, the, is, you can sometimes you know, people call it profits, but it's essentially the reward to the sector specific input. So in some in, in, in some industry this may be capital, in other industry it might be land, and you know the capital can come uh, be in different forms. But the key is here, the, it's a sort of an extreme assumption that you cannot move machines from one industry to the other. Every industry has its own machine. So with sewing machines, you can produce only shirts, but you are not allowed to produce shoes. You need different sewing machines for shoes, OK? This is the sort of extreme assumption. And they are not substitutable for each other. So then the sum of these overall sectors gives you aggregate profits or the aggregate reward to sector-specific inputs. Then here we have the sum of consumer surplus. Calculated in the usual way, it depends on price, and obviously consumer surplus declines in price. Profits rise in price, consumer surplus declines in price, and using standard results from uh, uh, microeconomic theory, the slope of this is just the output level, and the slope of this is minus the consumption level. And the last component here is the uh, essentially the revenue that the government collects from its policy. Instead of writing it in terms of the instruments TI, you can write it directly in terms of the prices. So think about the government choosing domestic prices. Then PI minus pi I should be an I here. Pi I, PI minus pi I times the quantity imported. This is the import volume. This is the revenue that the government collects on a particular product that's imported when it imposes a tariff, which is the difference between PI and PI. If this goods happens to be exported, then MI is simply negative. And then if the price is higher, it means we have an export subsidy. So this that generates negative revenue, and so on. So we just add it up over all sectors. And we have the revenue. So what is the assumption here? The assumption here is that after the government collects the net revenue, whatever it is, it distributes it back to the public. So the government is not using any revenue. So there are no losses on government activities other than the trade policies. So this is a sort of stylized structure which allows you to focus on uh, budget neutral trade policies. Of course, you can modify it if you want to, but the, the way it stands, the, the trade policies are budget neutral. Okay? So this is the basic structure that I'm going to use. Okay, so what sort of alternative uh, approaches were suggested uh, in the 1980s? So there's a very uh, famous paper by uh, Meyer from 1984 where he derived a, a, a characterization of an equilibrium tariff in a two-sector world, uh, which has all of the hexual lean time features. So for those of you who are not familiar with it, let me explain what, what's involved here. So think about two industries. One, say, capital, which is capital intensive, and the other is labor intensive. And the country trades with the rest of the world. It might be importing or net the capital intensive goods or the labor intensive goods, whichever case might be. This is uh, irrelevant here. Now, there is a famous result called the stolper Samuelson, the Samuelson theorem, which says that in this type of environment, if the price of, say, the capital-intensive good goes up, this raises the real reward to capital and reduces the real reward to labor. And in the alternative case, if the relative price of the labor-intensive good goes up, then the real reward to labor goes up and the real reward to capital. 
But the key is that one input gains in real terms and the other input loses. And the input that gains is the input which is intensive in the industry whose price went down. So this is the basic theory. So the, and this insight is what Meyer uh, exploit, exploited at the time. He assumed that every individual has the same amount of labor, but capital ownership is distributed in some way in the population. You can think about an arbitrary distribution of ownership. As a result, different people own different capital labor ratios. So then he said, what will be the equilibrium tariff? It will be the tariff most preferred by the median voter. So what's the sort of justification here? In this type of environment, uh, you know, the policy space is unidimensional, so you can imply the median voter theorem. The problem is that this is not necessarily the best theorem to apply to this sort of environment. Why? Because we know that this prediction is valid only if people vote on two alternatives at a time. And of course, this is also good only as long as we have a unidimensional space to vote. So for example, if we had many sectors, it wouldn't work anymore. But in this setup, the way he did it, uh, it works. We also know that if you put forward in a referendum, say, more than two alternatives, then the median voter theorem collapses. And there are, can be multiple equilibria uh, and so on. But in any case, so let's accept that this is a good approximation. Then the question is, what is the implication? So let's take our representation of these preferences. So what, how will it look like? in this type of world. So let's modify the equation that we had before in the following way. <coughs> I showed you the indirect utility function, which is the aggregate indirect utility function. But if we have a heterogeneous population, then obviously there is a different indirect utility function applicable to every individual, depending on their ownership of factors of production. So let's move to an environment where they vote separately on rates of protection in every industry, just to avoid the multidimensional policy space. Okay. So what's going to happen is, from the previous uh, indirect utility function, what's relevant for a particular individual is the following. Take an individual who owns a fraction gamma of the sector-specific input in sector I. Okay. What is this individual's welfare? It's increasing essentially in what we have here. He gets gamma, a fraction gamma of these profits, of the rewards to the sector-specific input. He gets the consumer surplus, the same consumer surplus as everybody else, assuming that they all have the same preferences. And he gets the same fraction of the revenue. And if this is the case, then the most preferred policy for this individual who is ownership gamma in this, uh, in this industry is simply the price P that maximizes his indirect utility fund. So PI gamma is simply the argument that maximizes this indirect utility fund. So if you now apply the median voter theorem, to this case, then the actual price will be the price that solves this problem for the median voter. And then you just write down the first order conditions and you get the following characterization. The trade policy, which is the difference between the domestic price and the international price, is equal to the output level minus the slope of the import demand function minus mi prime times gamma i m minus 1, where gamma i m is the ownership share of the median voter in sector i. Okay? Now, this may differ across sector because, for example, you may have a bunch of people who own the sewing machines for Shell, 
and another bunch of people who own the sewing machines for shoes. And the distribution of ownership of the first type of sewing machine is different than the distribution of ownership of the second sewing machine. If this is the case, then this ownership share of the median voter will be different in the garment industry than in the footwork industry. And the same logic applies more generally. Okay, so let me first talk about these terms because the way I've structured these equations, these terms would be repetitive. They will appear time and again in the various frameworks. So what this says is the following. If we have a tariff, say, think about the tariff. So when will we have a tariff? If the ownership share of the median voter exceeds one, and by normalization, one here is the ownership share of the mean, of the mean is the mean ownership share. So think about the continuum of voters and one is the mean. So gamma i can be above the mean or below the mean. Okay. So suppose we have a tariff if this difference is positive, essentially. Then, if we have a tariff, this says that the tariff is higher the larger the output of the industry. So it's positively correlated with the industry size. Why? Because you stand to gain more from a tariff if it's a big industry. And it's negative correlated with the slope of the import demand function. Why? For the same reason that indirect taxes are negatively correlated with slopes of demand function in the Ramsey optimal uh, ta uh, taxation formula. So what's the reason here? The reason is imagine that the demand function is very flat. So it's highly elastic. It's highly elastic, then a small tariff in this case, more generally a tax, will be highly distort distorting. It will generate a big Harberger triangle. So because it's costly and you care about welfare, then you don't tax it so heavily. But if the, you know, the demand is highly inelastic, then the Harberger triangle is small, and then you might choose to impose higher taxes because they are less costly in terms of excess barrel. So this is the, the logic. And this logic will sort of uh, reappear times and again in what I have to say. OK, so Meyer's uh, approach gives the prediction that rates of protection are related to these economic terms. And they are related to this political term, which is the difference between the ownership share of the median voter and the mean ownership share. So what's the problem here? The problem here is very simple. If the distribution of ownership is very skewed, then the median will be below the mean. So think about extreme cases where there's very high concentration of ownership. And then the median can be even zero. But in any case, it will be quite low relative to the mean. If this is the case, the prediction here is that there will be no, that we shouldn't have any tariffs. We should have actually uh, subsidies to imports. Why? Because the median voter here, who has a very small ownership share, doesn't gain income, or doesn't gain very much income from the tariff. On the other hand, the median voter uh, bears the full burden of the higher price in consumption. So this makes him unhappy, and he really doesn't want to have tariffs. What he wants is actually to subsidize imports so the prices are low. He pays cheaply for shells and footwear. And even if he owns a little bit of these machines, he loses just a tiny bit compared to what he gains in terms of consumption. Okay, and a second approach that was uh, so suggested uh, in, the, in, the, in the 1980s uh, is due to Arya Hillman in a paper published in uh, 1982. And what he did was he essentially adopted Stigler's framework to regulation. So Stigler's 
uh, framework to regulation, uh, which was uh, later extended by Pelsman and various other people, took a very simple approach. It said that politicians who choose policies are interested in, the, in political support. So there is a political support function which has the following features. They gain more support from industries if they, if they pursue policies which raise the industry's profitability. This is on the one hand. There has to be, on the other hand, something to offset it. So what offsets it in this story, on the other hand, is that you know, the more distorted the policies that they pursue, the more they harm the voters who are the consumers. And so the overall support depends on how much how happy they keep the industries and how unhappy they keep the consumers. And there's some trade off there. So in this, uh, if you adopt this framework, the simple uh, sort of uh, representation would be like this. This is the loss of utility of consumers if you pursue a policy vector P. And the optimal vector is pi. Pi, remember, is a vector of international prices. So any deviation from free trade here reduces welfare. I didn't show you that this is the case, but uh, it's very easy to prove that this is the case. So this difference is always negative uh, if p is different from pi. So this is the loss of utility of consumers. And now, for every industry, there might be a profit gain or loss depending on whether you raise the domestic price above the international price or the other way around. In the, theory, in the, uh, in the political support function, you weight this industry somehow. So in this case, it's a very simple linear weight, but you can do something uh, more elaborate. Okay, so Taking Stigler's approach, if you maximize this sort of political support function, you get this formula for uh, equilibrium rates of protection. So again, we have the economic factors, size of industry matters, and slope of the import demand function matters, for the same reason as before, namely the distortion that it generates. And this time, we also get the effect of how important the industry is perceived in the political support fund. So here you have always rates of pro positive rates of protection in this formulation. Every industry is positively protected. What does it mean? It means that if you in the import competing sectors, there should be tariffs. In the exporting sectors, there should be export subsidies. This is the implication. How high should the tariffs be, and how high should be the export subsidy be? In addition to the economic variable, an important variable is this BI, the weight that is placed in the political support function on this particular industry. Now, the problem with this approach is that it makes sense, but it's very hard to identify proxies for this weight BR. So if you, you know, with arbitrary uh, weights, you get arbitrary structures of protection. And it's very hard to predict, for example, how the rates of protection will vary across industries uh, with, with this approach. OK, then there are sort of two other uh, approaches on which I don't want to spend much time. There's the Findlay Wellish approach uh, of what's known as tariff formation uh, functions. Here you sort of have to commit whether you are in favor of protection or against protection, and then you give money to support protection or give money against protection. And there is some tariff formation function. This one, PI, which depends on how much money is collected in support of protection and how much against. And the problem here is that in order to predict what the rate of protection will be, you need to know what this terraformation function is. And you know, for you can choose terraformation functions that will yield basically anything you want. So it doesn't pin down very well the rate of protection. The, the last one 
which is an early predecessor of proper political economy consideration, uh, casted in a, in a type of voting model, is the approach which is originally due to McGee. And it was developed, uh, McGee had a paper in, I think, in 1974, uh, the first paper. Then he developed it with Bas Brock in a sequence of subsequent papers. And then together with Young in uh, 1989, they wrote a book which uh, is very elaborate in, uh, in expanding this approach. So this approach, okay, let me not go over the equations, uh, because they are really not very important. So the story in this approach is the following. Politicians are interested in increasing their probability of winning election. Okay, that's, that's the basic story. So what they do is they commit to trade policies. So you, we, each one of us can commit to some trade policies. And then what will happen is once we commit to trade policies, there will be different interests in the economy. Some will like my policy, others will like your policy. And then they will give me money in order to raise my probability of winning the election, or they will give you money to raise your probability of winning the elections. And the key is that there is some probability function, like this one here. So this is the probability that party A wins the election, given how much money is collected in its favor, given how much money is collected in favor of its rival, and given these policy vectors to which the parties have already committed. So uh, this is quite logical in many ways. Uh, the problem with this is the following, that for, again, for arbitrary probability functions Q, you get arbitrary outcomes. And the other is, it has a very counterfactual implication. And this is that if this is the structure of the game, then an interest group will contribute money to a, a, exactly one politician. The one, okay? So you will never give money in order to raise the probability to win an election to somebody that has committed to a policy which is worse from your point of view than the policy of some other politician. And this is very counterfactual because if you look at patterns of campaign contributions, they typically, at least in two-party systems, they will always give to both parties, almost always. It's very rare that they do it for uh, to one party. Okay, so the alternative to this would be the approach that Jim Grossman and I, and I developed, which is called the protection for sale approach. And this approach builds on the work of Bernheim and Winston on many options. So let me explain uh, how it works here. So the structure of the game uh, is as follows. In the first stage, a special interest group, SIG, stands here for special interest group, offers campaign contributions uh, CIP. And it can off make an offer which um, differs across political parties. So for every political party, it can make an offer. Now, the offer is essentially a whole schedule. So the offer says, for example, that if you impose a tariff of 10% on footwear, I'll give you $50,000. And if you impose a tariff, of 15%, I'll give you $60,000, and so on. So implicitly, there is some understanding at this stage of the game what these offers are. And then in the second stage, the policymaker chooses the policy vector, knowing these offers. What is the policymaker interested in here? So this is a reduced form objective function for the policymaker. It depends on aggregate welfare, WP, 
and on aggregate contributions from all the interest groups. So now an interest group might offer a con uh, contribution schedule to party A, it may make an offer to party B. You know. An important parameter here is A. It measures how important aggregate welfare is relative to contribution in the political objective one. Now, uh, this sort of uh, structure can, in principle, be applied to different uh, political systems. So, you know, um, if you think about a corrupt African uh, ruler, this may arise from the fact that the ruler basically takes all this money for himself, but he still cares to some degree about other people in the economy, the, the population there, because he doesn't want a revolt, for example. But you can also think about it as a framework to, which applies to representative democracies. And then this represents campaign contributions. So in a properly monitored democracy, when politicians get money for campaigns, they actually do spend them on campaigns. Sometimes they steal a little bit, you know, indirectly or indirectly. But suppose that they use it only for campaigns. Then why would they want to use it for campaigns? Well, the argument has to be that they want it for campaigns because this raises their chances of being elected. So you can micro-found uh, this sort of approach. So let me go over an argument. Uh, that explains the micro foundation and gives you an understanding of how this relative weight on welfare is related to some political features. Okay. Okay, so imagine that we live in a world of two, a two party world, uh, parties say A and B, and each party, the parties compete in an election. And every party chooses a policy during the elections. And then, if it's elected, it implements this policy. And this is an issue, whether parties implement what they promise. They often don't. And you can add another layer of what's the cost of not carrying out the policy to which you have committed in the elections. And there are models which I add here an additional stage in order to do just this. But I'm just, I, I'll stick with the simple representation here. So suppose that there's no commitment problem. If a party says it will implement certain tariffs or more generally policies, it will actually do if it will, is elected. OK, then there are a bunch of voters. And the voters derive direct utility from the policy vector of party K. This direct utility, in an economic model, you have to say what it is. And one option is to use the, indi the indirect utility function from which I start. And this is what we'll do eventually. But to understand the general setup, this can be any arbitrary structure behind it. And also, there is some additional utility of the voter, which is related to the particular party case. So, you may like a party not only because, for example, it supports free trade, but also because the person leading the party is very attractive, he's a great speaker, uh, you know, he has a particular stand on the Chechnya issue, a particular stand on the EU issue, things that are not necessarily economical. There's a, there's a set of non-economic issues on which parties take positions, and you may like these positions, or you may dislike these positions. So all of this is embodied in this additional term here. OK, then, uh, how do you vote here? You prefer party A if the gain over party B, from your point of view, in the economic benefits, which is the left-hand side here, exceeds the loss on the other issue. Then you want to support party A. Now there's a question whether you vote strategically or not, but it's really secondary. 
especially if you take a continuum of voltage. So think about eta. This is the difference between these two eta b, b and delta a, which so this measures by how much this individual prefers the position of party B over the position of party A on everything which is non, not economic. And then, if the economic benefit that he derives from A exceeds the economic benefit he derives from B by more than this, then he supports party A. Otherwise, he supports party B. Okay, so this is uh, the structure. Then assume that this eta is distributed uniformly over an interval, which is the, here described by two parameters, b and f. So f will be the density of the distribution, and b will be the bias, as you will see in a moment. Then you can compute the fraction of votes that party L, A will gain in the elections. And this fraction of votes is essentially one half minus b. So this is why I call B the bias. So B is the bias of the average voter towards party B here. And then times F, the density of the distribution, times the difference in the economic benefit. That is, uh, this is the average economic benefit in this population from having party A in power and the average economic benefit from having party B. So this is the formula that emanates from this uh, structure of uh, voting. Okay, so if all individuals were informed and they were, behave, were to behave in this way, then essentially you would get results which are well known from a, a paper by Lindbeck and Weibel uh, from, I think it's 1987. And you, can, you could have done it in different ways. The obvious thing that will come here is that if parties try to maximize either their probability of winning, winning their elections when they treat the bias B as being random, in political science this is sometimes related to what they call the balance shock. So you can make this random. And then this is an equation which tells you what the distribution of the votes is. And if you want to maximize your chances of winning the election, then what you do is you maximize, if you are party A, V of PA, and if you are party B, you maximize V of P. So then there's convergence in policies, and the two parties take exactly the same position. The alternative is, again, as is common in political science, instead of thinking about the, trying to maximize the probability of winning the election, you maximize what they call expected plurality. So you want a large share. You don't care just to win. You want to win by as, a big difference, as big as possible. And the policy position that you will take, the Nash equilibrium of the game in the policy space, will again need to converge. The interesting thing here is that what it is doing is the policy is going to maximize the mean utility. So this is sort of straightforward. OK, so obviously here, there is not much room to, for interest groups. So to introduce room for interest groups, let's now assume that there is only a fraction of voters who behave in the way I described before. So these are the people who read newspapers, who think about political issues, and they vote according to their assessment of the policy positions of the, uh, of the political parties. So only say only a fraction sigma is of this type, and there is some the residual fraction one minus sigma are what we can call uninformed voters. So this you can this is essentially borrowed from some work by David Barron, who has written a lot on political economy issues, and uh, uh, this is one approach that he advocated. So what's the difference now between the informed voter and the uninformed voter? The informed voter behave the way I've described before, but the uninformed, they basically can be influenced by campaign advertising or other means. 
And as a result, the political parties can attract a bigger fraction of these voters if they have a lot of money to spend. The money doesn't help them to attract informed voters because the informed voters assess the policies and they vote according to this assessment. So if you pay money for uh, your uh, staff to call uh, these voters and you hit an informed voter, it doesn't matter what you tell them, they know the facts and then they will vote according to the facts. But if you happen to hit an uninformed voter and you tell them that uh, uh, you know, your candidate uh, is great for them, then you might be able to influence them. But, so this is the, you know, Opa, what's going on here? Okay, so if, if you take this approach, then the share of votes going to party A is the weighted average of the share of votes that the party obtains from the informed voter, based on the idea that I described before. And then the residual share of voters get an attraction. There are some more details here which I've skipped, but you can represent them this way. Assuming that the bias is the same, then it's 1 half minus B times H multiplied by the difference in total campaign money available to party A and total campaign money available to party B. So H is a measure, essentially, of how effective money is in attracting uninformed voters. So it's a parameter in the, in the model and it tells you this. So you work it out and this is the, essentially the formula. So again, we have the same type of element that we had before, like this uh, density. But here we have this additional element. Okay, so in this case, it's sort of straightforward to show that now what happens is that if you are party A say, you want to maximize this utility V of PA, but you also are now interested in these contributions because you can use the contributions to attract uninformed voters. So the intuitive trade-off that is built into the system is the following. If, say, the shoemakers come to me and they want me to impose a tariff on shoes and they want to give me money in exchange, then I can be attracted to take this money. What do I gain? I, of course, I get the money, and with this money, I will go and attract some uninformed voters who will support me. However, if I impose the tariff, I'm hurting the utility of the voters. And the informed voters understand that my policy is helpful to them. So I'm going to lose some informed voters. So now my trade-off is to get the money and to attract some uninformed voters and to lose some informed, informed voters at the same time. Or not to take the money and lose some of the uninformed voters, but to get the uninformed voters at the mouth. So this is basically the trade. And this boils down to exactly the type of equation that we had before, with which I started to reduce form objective function. And A has now an interpretation. Remember, A was the relative weight on welfare as opposed to contribution. So what does this say? It says, well, implicitly, the political system is placing more weight on welfare as compared to contributions, the larger the fraction of informed voters. So you can, for example, if there are more newspapers, uh, more TV, independent TV stations, you might have a higher sigma. So this will say that implicitly the system will, under these circumstances, place more weight on welfare than on contributions. It also is negatively related to age because if it's very effective to spend money and attract un un uninformed voters, then obviously you place less weight on welfare. And lastly, it's positively related to F, which is the density here, 
But uh, more generally, if we wrote instead of a uniform distribution, we had a non-uniform distribution, what will appear here is uh, really the density at zero. Now, why is this the density at zero? Because this measures how many people are swing voters. So the more swing voters there are, the more weight you place on welfare as opposed to contributions. So these are the sort of three key elements which drive the relative weight uh, which we have sort of uh, started with. I'll jump over many details. Okay, I'm sorry about this. Um, I didn't think that it's the thing. Yeah. Okay, so what is the sort of analytical approach that I want to discuss now? So think about a two stage game where in the third stage, the interest groups move. How do they move? They offer uh, campaign co uh, contributions. So now think about a uh, policy maker and the interest group. So forget about multiple policy makers because we already saw that they will all behave in the same way. So we don't have to go through it again. So what's the preference of the interest group? It has some utility from the policy team. This is for interest group I. And this is the schedule that it proposes. Now, in the first stage of the game, the interest group chooses the schedule. So the strategy space of interest groups are these contribution schedules. Once the interest groups have chosen these contribution schedules, in the second stage, the policy maker maximizes its objective funds, taking as given these contribution schedules. What is the policy space of the policy maker is the policy vector. Okay. And A is this relative weight on welfare that we have discussed in some detail before. Okay, so to illustrate how this works, let me start with a very simple case and you'll get the intuition for it. A simple way to think about it, uh, at least in a, let's take the case of a single interest group and a single policy. And I'll jump to the generalization in a moment. So suppose there's only one interest group and one policy possible. So suppose that the policy is a tariff on shoes, on football. Okay, that's it. We know that they will never impose a tariff on shares. They will never provide a subsidy to hair dryers and things of this. So that's it. All we can do is a tariff on shoes. And there's one interest group. These are the shoe manufacturers. So how will they behave? So this is now a very a simple a way to think about it is to start with a very simple principal agents problem. So in the, if this is a simple principal agent problem, then the principal has to choose the policy and how much money to give the agent. Okay? He, of course, he has to choose the policy and the money to satisfy the agent's participation constraint because otherwise this would be useless. So let him choose this instead of the schedule. After we find out what the optimal policy from the point of view of the principal is, we'll see whether we can support this outcome with a contribution schedule. Okay? Okay, so in the simple principal agent problem, a way to think about it is the following. The principal says, okay, if I don't do anything, then the agent is going to choose some policy, and the agent will reach some welfare level as a result. If we use our specification, then we know that what the agent will do, the agent will maximize aggregate welfare, because I don't offer anything. If the agent maximizes aggregate welfare, he's going to allow free trade in footwear. So the policy is going to be 
the international price. The domestic price would be the international price. And there will be a difference curve for the policy maker, which looks like this. Basically, well, it doesn't have to be, has this nice convexity property, but it will be tangent to the horizontal axis at, at pi. This it has to satisfy. So if I move away from pi in one direction or the other, I'm worsening welfare, and therefore I'm worsening the welfare of the policy maker. So now, what does the participation constraint mean? It means that if I want to choose a different policy, I have to give some money. But I have to give enough money so that the welfare of the policy maker is at least as high as along this G indifference curve. Because otherwise, they will tell me, thank you very much, and I'm not interested in your offer. So it means I have to choose points which are above this indifference, G indifference curve. They have to be above, or on this indifference curve. So now I have my own preferences with these indifference curves. So what it means is, if I get more protection, I am better off, and then I can offer more money in order to be indifferent. And what I want to do now is, I want to go to the lowest indifference curve, as low as possible, <coughs> to maximize my welfare, subject to the participation constraint. And then the solution is at this point here. Okay. So this is the best I can do, and this is the solution to the principal agent problem. So this, you are all familiar with this. I'm sure you saw it in different forms. So now the question is, can I implement this solution with the contribution schedule? And the answer is yes, I can. I can construct any arbitrary schedule which separates these two indifference curves. So it's like a separating a surface, yes? Not a hyperplane like we are used to in general equilibrium field, but it's a separating surface. And there are many separating surfaces here. Any, any sort of curve that goes between them and it's tangent to the two at A and then proceeds will do. So this point you have to bear in mind because it generates complications when there are many interest groups competing. When there's one interest group, it doesn't make any difference. It's always the same policy solution and the same contribution level. But when there are multiple interest groups, this causes complications. I mentioned uh, them later. So there's one particular contribution schedule which plays um, an important role, and this is what uh, uh, Bernheim and Winston called a truthful contrib contribution schedule, but we prefer to call it a compensating contribution schedule. So it's a schedule which coincides with this indifference curve, I, until it hits the line. And then it runs along the horizontal axis. So why is it compensating? Because what you do here is you offer money to the politician in exchange for favor, but in a way that keeps your utility constant. So this is the sense in which it is compensating. And the key is that this schedule always exists. So generally, there's going to be a set of optimal strategies for every interest group. And the compensating schedule will be always in this set. Okay. Now what happens if there are a number of interest groups, but still we have only one policy instrument so that we can have a figure? Then think about interest group I. If interest group I doesn't play uh, pay ball, using an American expression. I don't know if you are familiar with it. So if interest group I doesn't make any offers, it says, okay, I'm not playing the political game, then what is going the politician do? The politician will have a, a welfare level G minus I of T, which is A times W, and the sum of all the contributions offered by all the other interest groups, excluding I. So the interest group I knows that if it walks away from Washington, say, then the other groups will have made already these offers. We are playing a Nash game here in the first stage. Then the politician is going to maximize this objective. 
namely they are going to choose a policy P that maximizes this objective function. Now, this now will not be necessarily free trade because, for example, if the leather manufacturers play the game, they will want protection because this will raise the demand for leather. Right? And if the producers of sneakers participate, they will want negative protection because if the price, sorry, no, they will want also positive protection because if the price of shoes goes up, then this will raise the demand for sneakers. Okay. So in any case, there are all sorts of parties that might be involved here. Okay, so what's the solution now? So now, the preference of the policymaker when I doesn't participate is some other function with an optimum with P minus I, which is not necessarily the international price. But the residual interest group I is still solving a similar problem. And now it's also choose, can choose now a separating surface, which will be its contribution schedule. And one of them is the compensating schedule, as it was before. OK, so what's the complication now? The complication is that the shape of this indifference curve depends on the contribution schedules offered by the other special interest group. It's not independent. It depends on it now. And therefore, my contribution schedule will typically also be dependent on what the others do. Now, this interdependence generates multiple equilibrium. So what uh, one can show is that if everybody plays compensating strategies, then the equilibrium is unique. Okay? And not only is it unique, it has some nice properties. You know, not everybody likes the same refinements to games, but this uh, equilibrium happens to be coalition proof. So this is a, a nice property, at least for some people, not for everybody. Okay. Okay, so once we do this, We can uh, jump quickly to here. Stop here. So look on a. So you can then show that the equilibrium policy will be the price vector which maximizes A W plus the sum of all the W J. Remember the W Js are the utility levels of the interest groups. Okay. And if we apply this to our particular problem, namely with this sort of preference function, then we have a very clean solution. Now what is this preference function? It's basically the one we had before. Except that now alpha i represents the fraction of voters or individuals who own the sector-specific input in sector I. And they form the interest group which promotes protection of sector I. So they get also, they get all the profits from this sector, but they also get this fraction of the revenue and this fraction of the, uh, of the uh, consumer self. So when you solve this problem, you end up with this formula of protection. So this is a formula which tells you what the equilibrium rate of protection is in sector I, and it provides some predictions about the cross-sectional variation. <coughs> so let me briefly say what we have here. So x over minus mi prime is exactly the same terms as we have before. So I've explained what they are and where they come from in the same reason. The new terms that we have here is the following. We have A, which we discussed in detail. This is the relative weight on welfare. And alpha O is simply the sum of all these alpha I's. So what does alpha O represent? 
it represents what fraction of people, voters, say, are participating in the political process in the sense that they are represented by some interest group. So I may be represented by the footwear industry, and one of you by the garment industry, and another one by uh, eyeglasses manufacturers. But all of us together will be a fraction alpha O of the population. What it means is that the residual fraction are possibly workers who own labor and they sell their labor services, but they don't own any of the sector specific needs. And then uh, capital II is an indicator variable which is equal to one if the industry has an organized group and zero otherwise. Okay? Now, in this formulation, the assumption is that every, industry, every interest group lobbies for the entire price vector. Now, this may not always be a good specification because it's possible that the shoe manufacturers lobby only for protection of shoes and the garment manufacturers lobby only for the protection of garments. If this is the case, then this formula will apply only to industries which, are, uh, which have lobbies, and this II will be replaced by 1. This is the, the basic idea modification that, uh, uh, that is needed. OK, so what, what is now the prediction? I move from this formula to this one which is typically used in the empirical studies. And this basically rewrites this last term, the economic component, in this way. It's 1 over the import penetration ratios. So this is imports divided by our domestic output. And uh, epsilon i is the import elasticity of demand. So import elasticity of demand, for example, of the, or our, you typically have the order of 3 to 5. And of course, there's quite a bit of variation across industries, but this is the, the, the range. And in UI, there is a lot across industries as well, uh, depending on some industries import a lot relative to domestic output and others uh, uh, import little. So these effects we have discussed, so the only ones that I need to discuss are here. So all this, the, all this says is the following. Think about an industry which is organized then this ii is equal to 1. So the question is, how high is the tariff level in this organized industry? Well, this says it's higher the lower the import penetration ratio and the lower the elasticity of import demand. So these are the economic factors. In terms of political factor, it's lower the more weight is placed on welfare as compared to contribution. But this applies to all the sectors. And it's lower the more representative, the more people are representative in the political process. And you can think about an extreme case, for example, where every, everybody is represented, then the rate of protection will be zero. So I lobby against you, you lobby against me, and we all give money to the politicians, but at the end of the day, none of us gain, gains, uh, makes any gain. So why do I lobby? When I don't get a gain compared to free trade, I lobby because I know that if I walk away, you lobby, and this will worsen my, my situation. So I lobby in order to offset your efforts. And then, at the end, none of us gets anything, but the politician collects a big pile of money. Mm -hmm. this is, so this, this is a, an extreme sort of outcome. Okay, so this type of equation was first estimated by Goldberg and Martin in, uh, in an AER paper in 1919, uh, 1999. So they used uh, US data, and they suggested an approach uh, which has been widely used, although it has also been widely criticized. Uh, and it was sort of criticized on, in different dimensions. Uh, the first thing is 
they use, instead of tariffs, non-tariff barriers, essentially what, what we call coverage ratios. So if you take a particular uh, product category, you look what fraction of the goods in the product category are c covered by non-tariff uh, barriers. And why did they do it? The argument was that and when in their data, tariff law levels in the U.S. are extremely low and there is little variation across sectors because this was after a long run of multilateral trade negotiations when the tariffs went down to very low levels. On the other hand, as is well known to experts of international trade policy, as the tariffs came down, the U.S. kept erecting more and more non-tariff barriers across more and more industries, essentially. Countervailing duties, anti-dumping uh, provisions, and things of this sort. So they made this replacement. Then they rewrote the formula in this way and put the elasticity on the left-hand side simply because there were no good estimates of import elasticities of demand for the US. But it was a very noisy variable. And this is a sort of standard way to get rid of some of uh, measurement errors. So the idea behind their estimation was the following. If you take this equation, as uh, it appears here, you can make the following distinction. Make a distinction between organized sectors and not organized sectors. Then what's the difference? In the organized sectors, this indicator variable is 1. In the non-organized sector, it should be 0. So if you regress the left-hand side on the inverse of the input penetration ratio, you'll get an estimate of 1 minus alpha O over A plus alpha O in the first case. And you'll get minus alpha O over A plus alpha O in the second case. So you get two, uh, you'll estimate two parameters, but then if you know linear algebra, you'll be able to use them to recover the underlying structural parameters, which is A and alpha O. So this was the sort of methodological innovation. But in order to do it, what you need is you need a way to identify which sectors are organized and which are not. And this is an impossible task, basically. So what they did was, and they ha uh, how, how long shall I take? Uh, I, I have to gauge what, what I say. Ten, ten minutes? Ten minutes past. Yeah, okay. Four fifteen. Four fifteen. No, it's okay. I'm, okay. I, I don't want to keep people away from their important work. <laughs> okay, so... Uh, so the question is, how do you, it's, it's clear that the, identifica you know, the ide identification restriction here it comes through the choice of which industries are organized and which are not. And there are no simple ways to do it. So what they did was, they have chosen to use what's called in the US PAC contributions. PACs are political action committees. Unlike in most countries in the world, actually I don't know about any country which has this institutional setup, a PAC, a political action uh, committee, is an organization which is giving money to politicians. It has to be registered, there, are, there is a law which limits how much it's allowed to give, and all these contributions are registered, and actually you can go to a website and and download it. Now the problem, of course, with this type of data is that when a PAC gives $5,000 to a politician, you don't know that they gave the $5,000 in order to secure protection of the footwear industry. They gave $5,000, that's all you know. And typically these PACs, you know, they are interested in policy packages, so it's a uh, sort of very hard to isolate whether they lobby for footwear or for something else. But nevertheless, this is what they use. So they have decided about some contribution cutoff and say everybody above the cutoff is organized. 
for this particular purpose, and everybody below is not organized. And they, they did a lot of sensitivity analysis by sort of playing around with the cutoff and seeing whether the estimates change uh, dramatically or not. Okay, so this is the approach that they use. And uh, the estimates that came, they came up with are these estimates. So, I mean, they have a range of estimates, but the sort of model estimate is that alpha is about 85%, namely 0 0.85, and A is in, in the range of 50 to 70. So this sort of number looked reasonable to many people, because what, what, what it's saying is that 85% of the US voters are represented in the political process through some interest group. Basically, that's all it's saying. But the other number uh, sounded uh, a little bit uh, too high, to say the least. Yes. Because this says that uh, the US policy formation process places weight on welfare, which is like 50 or 70 times higher than the weight on contributions. And people who are familiar with the US political system say this is just impossible. You know, the, the weight on welfare relative to contribution has to be much lower. But it doesn't matter what you do to these data. That's basically what you get. You know, you get very high numbers uh, for it. Last question. Uh, so they, uh, how do they measure uh, elasticity times coverage ratio? So the coverage ratio, they Before. measure the way I told you. Yeah. And the elasticities, they essentially took the elasticities. There is a range of estimates that were provided by Gildorf and Stern. They use their numbers. Now, the, the, the beard of stern estimates are very inaccurate to say the least. Uh, some of them are guesstimates rather than estimates. If you look at the number, they don't make any sense. So, and it was strange because there were no, uh, for the US, there, there didn't exist sectoral estimates of import elasticity of demand beyond those at the time. Now there are. Now, there are much better estimates now, and actually I'm surprised that nobody has sort of repeated the exercise using the new estimate. There is, there is a big study by Broda and Weinstein where they estimate the 10,000 elasticities of substitution. And you can use them to construct sectoral estimates of uh, import elasticities of demand. But it has been used in some, for some issues, but not for this. But this paper, the Broda Weinstein paper, is from uh, 99, uh, 2006, yes, so it's almost 10 years after uh, their, their publication. Okay, so this exercise was repeated using a different identification strategy by the and, and I cannot pronounce this name. <laughs> Or the Pattaya, uh, I think it's Thai, it's a Thai name. And, uh, and it was also repeated by Mitra, uh, Tomatas, and Ula Basku. And this is actually an interesting study. Why? Because they did not use US data, they used Turkish data. And unlike in the US, in Turkey they had reasonably good estimates of import demand elasticity at the sectoral level. And also, Turkey had tariffs which were high and also varied a lot across sectors. So they could use tariffs instead. But they used exactly the same methodology. And then, as an identification strategy for organized versus non-organized sectors, they used, uh, they looked at uh, the participation of firms in a sector in the organization of manufacturers. And those who had a big participation, they said they are organized. And those who didn't say they are, they are not organized. The other nice thing about the Turkish strategy is that they had these data for different time periods. So they could estimate it once during the military regime and once in the post-military regime. And they found that the numbers there were, of course, different. There was lower participation and lower weight on welfare. But the interesting finding, in particular, is 
that they found that the post-military regime, the weight on welfare, was much higher than during the military regime. So this provides some credence to these estimates, but you know, all of this looks pretty noisy, yes. Another study, uh, we, uh, in, uh, which is interesting, is the one by McCallman, uh, which is for Australia. So Australia had very high tariffs for most of the years. And they, then they had a very major tariff reform in 1991. And what uh, McCallman uh, uh, shows is that in the, the post-reform, tariff structure is very much correlated with this type of equation. So you can sort of explain what happened if you use this, this type of equation. Uh, the last thing that I want to mention uh, is this study by Mitra, Tomakos, and Oliva uh, Sodu, which uh, is in the Canadian Journal of Economics in 2006, and it's very different from this one. And they make a set of arguments here, uh, which is sort of interesting. They argue that if you look at the data carefully, you cannot reject the hypothesis that all the sectors are basically organized. And that this attempt to separate between organized and organized is not a very useful uh, uh, identification strategy. So they, the way they do it is they they construct the left-hand variable like this, including the inverse of the equal penetration ratio. And they argue that if you run it on different groups of industries, and then you do a kolmogorov smirnov test of the distribution of the left-hand variable, you cannot reject the hypothesis that the distributions are the same. So this is the sort of initial argument that they make. So if this is the case, they say, then we cannot separately identify A and alpha O. We can identify this variable, but not separately A and alpha O. So then they go through a set of estimates to sort of illustrate this point, and this is the, the last thing I will, I will go over. Let me enlarge it. Now that I am mechanically literate. Okay. So I mean, that, all the numbers don't matter, but uh, the, I just want to illustrate once uh, you know, what, what, what the logic of the do is. So they run these regressions for what was considered in. Uh, in the Goldberg Magic paper is organized sectors, and then they do it for all the sectors. Okay. So obviously they have more sectors here than here. And then they say, you know, we can estimate only this coefficient beta, and we cannot separately identify alpha O and A. But what we can do is for different values, say of alpha O, see what the corresponding A is, and we can put standard deviations on this estimate. So this is something you can do. So now, if you were a Bayesian, you would say, you know, my guess is that the fraction of people who are represented in the political process via interest groups is, say, 70%. If I believe it's 70%, then A is 15.75. That's much more reasonable than 50 or 70. On up, I don't know what grounds this is more reasonable. <laughs> But I think everybody feels more comfortable with this number. And if we go up to 80%, then it's 10. And if we go up to 90%, it's 4 and a half. So the actually, in this range in which of the estimates of uh, Goldberg and Maggi, there's a very fast decline in the relative weight on, on wealth. If you now do it for all the industries, not just the organized one, you estimate the, be the beta from the equations that I showed you before. Again, you look here, the numbers are a little different, but they are much lower. Okay? And uh, they sort of go over this exercise also with uh, 
They go also, uh, for over this x are also for the non parent values, which is what. And uh, you see, it's again, it looks very much more reasonable in, the, in whatever sense you want to think about it. Yes? All these numbers, they really go down dramatically. Okay, so uh, this is essentially the last slide I want to show you. Uh, but the point I want to make is the following. The sort of view that we have a lot of protection, which is hard to explain, has dominated our thinking for many, many years. We have now a framework which seems to reasonably fit the data in some sense. But of course, this is very limited as is, because there are much, many other features of protection which haven't been investigated. So for example, the fact that the U.S., not only the U.S., but also the EU, as a result of the decline in tariffs uh, uh, via the Uruguay round, which ended in 1994, made a big shift away from tariff protection to non-tariff barriers. And these non-tariff barriers are quite different across countries, and they take different forms. The U.S. relies very heavily on anti-dumping duties since mid, the mid-90s. Uh, and then there are the uh, anti-dumping duties, and then there are the, there's this new mechanism for, uh, for dispute settlements in the WO, which sees more and more cases grow to be resolved. So all these new forms are very different from what we had before. And those who are interested in the political economy of protection have to change gear and try to think more seriously how, what are the political motives behind these alternative mechanisms. Uh, and I guess the theory would be, would, would be quite different if, if properly done. OK, so this is just, I gave you today an illustration of how to deal with these issues. But the basic approach can be applied not only to tariffs, to many other uh, policy issues. And of course, in every case that you want to apply, you have to carefully think about the institutional structure within uh, your life. Even here, I haven't taken uh, into account in the presentation all sorts of restrictions that are imposed by the WTO, for example. But I'll stop here. I think this is enough for one.